Hi, I'm Alex Schmidt, and Spotify is the newest music-killing T-1000. Unless we Schwarzenegger it. Tom York is the lead paranoid android of Radiohead, a band from the future that hates the future's guts. And when Radiohead released a new album in 2016, they tried to release it every way there is, except Spotify. Because Tom York hates Spotify. In 2013, he pulled his solo work off it. He called Spotify bullshit, a mind trick, and the last desperate fart of a dying corpse. And other artists call Spotify a smelly banana, a creative content sucker, a machine devaluing music itself. And are they right? They are and aren't. Both, both things, they aren't. Nope, that, that doesn't read. Uh, Spotify is trying to save music by helping record labels become even more evil and by shape-shifting the music industry without anybody noticing. It's hard to claim Spotify's killing the music industry, seeing as how the music industry died of piracy already. But first things first, if you've never used Spotify, here's how. Step one, download it. Step two, hear any song you want. Step three, pay Spotify a subscription fee or listen to Spotify's ads between songs. I know, nobody wants to do that, but holy moly, remember step two, any song you want. It's like if somebody put your old stolen LimeWire music library on every device you own, made it legal, and fixed the mislabeled songs for you. No more listening to Newfound Gory, or My Chemical Rum Dance, or Jimmy Eat Worm. All thanks to Spotify founder Daniel Eck. He went to the record labels and told them they could save their industry by supporting his startup idea. His entrepreneurial idea was that piracy wasn't preventable, but it was replaceable. Replaceable if access to any song could be easy, legal, and comprehensive. This three-point idea became Spotify, a service saving people the trouble of stealing anything and letting the industry earn more than zero dollars for their music. Spotify is legalized piracy. Pirates even built it. Daniel X's previous job was running uTorrent, a site 100 million people use for file sharing of varying legality. Eck and his first staffers hail from Sweden, home to indestructible copyright flaunter Pirate Bay, home to a piracy-based political party, and a land where two-thirds of folks aged 16 to 29 steal media. Eck also brought in Sean Napster Parker as an early advisor for Spotify, hired the guy who built uTorrent software to build Spotify, and when Eck demoed Spotify's software for the record labels, its temporary demonstration purposes only music library was made of Spotify staffers' personal pirated music collections pooled onto a drive. Said Eck, we are Swedish, so we'd already taken it. Those pirate demos won the labels over. Spotify launched in 2008 with rights to nearly every song there is, and eight years later, Spotify's convinced over 40 million people to buy monthly subscriptions to that library, plus around three ad-based listeners for every one of those subscribers. Which means Spotify's 100 million users have no reason to steal songs. It's like if the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie opened with Jack Sparrow taking an office job. Yes, it's not as exciting as piracy, but it'd save us from years of horribly wasted energy. Piracy is tiring, and Spotify's handing us all of music for cheap. So cheap, Spotify loses money every year. And they are losing less money each year, but they're giving the record labels an estimated 70% of their revenue, along with ownership of a lot of Spotify the company. Which is not exactly the savviest, Scrooge McDuckiest way to hang on to your... what whatever Swedish currency might be. Uh, models? Lingonberries? I don't know. Either way, Spotify's burning away the rest of their Scandinavian funny money on research and development, improving the product to make your life better. Spotify hired a team of 32 music experts to curate over 4,500 free playlists. Spotify spent $100 million on a startup called Echo Nest to improve Spotify's music recommendations and help build Discover Weekly, an algorithm-based weekly playlist individualized to every Spotify user and celebrated with fancy Webby Awards. They also launched personal new music lists in August, and their mobile app has features like Spotify Running, which syncs your workout with exclusive pump-up jams. And I know, making their product better helps them make a buck. I know, but Spotify took itself from idea to all the music to exciting way to experience all the music. And if Spotify became that by bankrupting itself, how can anybody say Spotify is bankrupting musicians? Okay, well, there you go. 
Spotify's become an amazing part of the music industry. The trouble is, they might become the entire music industry. With the addition of The Beatles' Last Christmas Eve, Taylor Swift became the only major musician Spotify doesn't have their mitts on. Spotify's mitts also have most streaming music listeners. Apple Music is Spotify's closest thing to a competitor, but it launched eight years too late with an unpopular interface and an unnecessary radio station. Today, Apple Music has less than half Spotify's subscriber base. Even though the world's favorite gadgets promote Apple Music every time you listen to them. It's like if Sarah McLachlan became the world's biggest celebrity and still couldn't get anybody to save a puppy. And I respect your goals, Sarah Bear, but my landlord flips out when I have guests. Spotify's only other real competitor is Tidal, the streaming service from Jay-Z's Musical Justice League, which can't find a long-term CEO, can't live on Beyonce alone, loses more money every year, and is praying Apple will put them out of their misery. So maybe Daniel Eck is right. Maybe streaming music is growing fast enough to replace what record labels lose in downloads and album sales. But if Spotify conquers the streaming music world, and that's the entire music world, what can artists do but take what Spotify gives them? And even if Spotify is handing out billions of dollars in royalties, by the way, that $2 billion figure you're seeing is from back in 2014. Aren't musicians still screwed if too little of that money reaches them? According to the Wall Street Journal, Spotify pays a per stream royalty of $0.006, less than a penny, which goes to the record companies who give a fraction of the fraction of that penny to artists who have to give lots of their fraction of a fraction to management, the government, groupies, hangers on. Watching that royalty shrink is like watching Gordon Ramsay chop a vegetable because it's kind of terrifying how fast they can obliterate it, but you gotta give them credit <laughs> and be terrified of them. All at once. It's very, it's complicated. And Spotify must know how terrifying the record companies are getting, because most of Spotify's record company contracts are under wraps. But The Verge got a hold of Spotify's contract with Sony, and they published it, and it says Sony has no contractual obligation to pay a specific percentage of Spotify royalties to its artists. And since record companies have a track record of taking anything from their artists that isn't bolted down, it's hard to expect Spotify's generosity to get past this century's cigar-chomping music moguls. Even worse, Spotify's uninterested in changing that business model. Remember Tom York, the, the angry robot from before? It turns out he was willing to put Radiohead's new album on Spotify the same day it came out everywhere else, if Spotify only let Spotify's paying subscribers stream it and withheld it from their ad-supported kind of freeloader users. Spotify refused to do that, and Tom York caved because he isn't Adele. In 2011, she gave Spotify York's same offer for her album, 21. Spotify said no. Adele boycotted Spotify, and she sold millions of albums without them twice in a row. But Tom York won't sell millions of his Sadness Spot records. A moon-shaped pool went live on Spotify the same day it was in stores. Because two musicians on Earth are Spotify proof. Good job. Millions of people buy their albums. People even leave their house, and it's, it's crazy, they leave their house and they go to a store to buy a physical copy of it without stopping halfway down their driveway and asking themselves if they're a historical reenactor for the Bill Clinton years. But every other megastar has to cave in to Spotify or set piracy records, their choice. And if you're a kind of famous band like Grizzly Bear or Portishead, some of the people watching this video recognized your band's name when I said it just now. So you're famous enough to supplement your crummy Spotify revenue by going on tour, by selling t-shirts, even by tricking a couple people into buying fragile wax versions of your album, like their historical reenactors for the Kennedy years. But even though famous artists complain the loudest about Spotify, Spotify does the most damage to the nobodies. Because Spotify made music discovery their biggest selling point and every user's homepage. It's where we find bands now. So new bands depend on Spotify's algorithm, and if it points listeners a band's way, they get fractions of pennies one time. It's like if all bands had to make a living as street musicians, and they could only play in one creepy alley, chosen for them by robots, and passerby could make their pocket change this horribly specific. So if Spotify replaced piracy by making a life in music even worse, isn't that a disaster for our future? Will we even have professional musicians anymore? <laughs> Oh, right. Remember in the Terminator franchise how Skynet was supposed to keep us all safe, but it killed us all, and then it didn't, 
actually kill us all because some of us survived through ingenuity and grit. Well, music history is a series of technological advances that Skynet musicians, ruining their livelihoods out of nowhere. But somehow, every time, the people creating music Sarah Connor their way through that disaster and thrive, becoming scarred but tougher and capable of more visually impressive antics than ever before. That metaphorical process goes all the way back to the invention of recorded music. Records were supposed to destroy all musicians. Because before Thomas Edison invented the phonograph in 1877, music only existed in its live meat space form. Somebody sings or plays an instrument, you hear it when they do it, show's over. But according to this amazing Smithsonian piece, the phonograph caused mass music world panic. People thought concerts would die out and folks would get addicted to record listening. Band leader John Philip Sousa said recordings of great musicians would discourage children from learning instruments. Hey fellow modern people, uh, remember how Pokemon once only existed as cards and Game Boy games? But then Pokemon Go spread them worldwide all around us and convinced the olds that Pokemon caused car crashes and walking off cliffs. Well, music was like that. Spreading it worldwide in a recorded form changed the world. It created record companies who immediately screwed over artists, particularly minorities and live concerts lost their monopoly on good songs. But music mutated to keep up. Music recordings popularized jazz because as people got sick of records, they started to value improvisation. Also, people still go to concerts, and Sousa was wrong. The phonograph sparked an increase in music students. Best of all, according to UNC historian Mark Katz, early wax cylinders could only hold two to three minutes of music. So artists created songs that work within that time constraint, and that's how we invented the pop song. I'm telling you, every technological leap since the phonograph has made music more accessible, more modern, and not dead. Cheap radios, uh, bootlegs on cassettes, privately recording broadcasts, sampling other artists, all those things expanded the world of music. They all paid financial dividends one way or another, and they were scary because a lot of the financial dividend sources changed, and yes, some of the payouts shrank. But don't panic about today, because if only Adele and Taylor can still go platinum, and only Adele can still get richer than God from album sales, the way every collection of five goobers in cool shirts once could just by frosting their tips and firing up the Studio Magic console, that change just means the music industry needs to mutate again. And however evil Spotify might be, it's as evil as the record companies have been for a long, long time. However, Spotify aims to be with us for a long time by conquering the world. They're expanding their service to offer videos and podcasts so they can be everything. And Daniel Eck is the kind of person who refers to Facebook's Mr. Zuckerberg as Mock and then feels guilty about it. Like he admitted he and M-Dog are world government buddies. And why wouldn't Mr. Eck get a seat at the Illuminati super table? His techno child Spotify took over worldwide music listening within a decade. But there was a time when an iPod loaded with an iTunes library was the world's mightiest music gadget. There was a time when Blockbuster Video and Microsoft were getting sued by the government for being too dominant and powerful, and we were alive for all of that. So if we want an alternative to Spotify, we might find it soon in the next big thing around the corner. Also, if, if you're watching this in the future and Spotify's murder robots have me on trial for crimes against robomanity, I was kidding. Let me, let me take that again. I was kidding. Okay, nope, let me take that. Uh, I was kidding. Damn my honesty. Run, future Alex. <laughs> Hi, thank you for watching. Please do all the YouTube things below, and in the comments, let us know if there are any other like big topics in the world you think we you'd like to see like this, or how dope the Terminator movies are. You know, I want I want everybody to have something. So, big big issues. Uh, where to go after Genesis?